Merry Christmas still? Still. <laughs> Christmas is a, a, it's a long feast. It's not quite as, as long as Easter, of course. It, when, when we get to Easter, I'm always ready for Easter to end by the time we get to the end of it. But Christmas is one that, that I, I, I have just enough gas to get through Christmas where I'm really excited about it still as it's ending. And this last feast is one of the, well, this penultimate feast is one of the ones that, that sort of reignites that, that excitement for me. Uh, the Feast of Epiphany, the, the advent or the arrival of the Magi, the wizards of the East, these mystical men of great power and wealth who humble themselves to make the journey to come and see the Christ. And so as we sort of talk about this feast, I, I'm going to do it in, in three sort of distinct ways. I want to talk about it just sort of contextually and historically so that we can get a better idea of what's going on, a better imagination, you know, more, more color for our imagination in understanding what's, what's happening here. Then I want to talk about it in terms of the context of, of salvation, so eschatologically, like um, what, what's actually happening here in the history of salvation. And then I want to look at it morally. And, and it's kind of going to be in that way that you and I as Christians already living in sort of this fulfilled moment um, can take away uh, the, the great gifts for ourselves um, in being able to, to live more, um, more closely with the image of Christ. So, first thing that's happening here, right? Christ is born, and when he's born, a star, it's like a big flare, gets, goes up into the sky, and it, it rests over Bethlehem, so we're told. Way, way, way out in the east, in the Orient, we're not allowed to say that anymore, but I say it anyways, in the Orient, um, these, these natural, mystical, pagan, they're really Astrosaurians. Astro, um, uh, am I saying that? No, they're not. No, Ast, um, Freddie Mercury was one of these guys. Zoroastrian, thank you. Thank you. Zoroastrian. I, I, I'm, I'm, my brain's not firing on all cylinders this morning. You guys are going to have a riot with that. So the Zoroastrians um, and, and whatever sort of spin-offs of that religion in that area that you've got, um, I was making fun of, uh, of the pagans last night, and I was like, oh, yeah, they're worshiping alligators and worshiping cats. And then I thought, wait a minute, I know somebody who worships <laughs> cats. He was very quick to point out to me, not that he doesn't worship cats, but the Zoroastrians don't worship cats. That was, that was his takeaway from that when he heard me say that. So anyways, these are, these are, are, are not... Jews, that's the point. They are not in any way people who know who God is. They're people who are of sincere heart. They are people who are, are very wise. They, they are people who are scientists and naturalists, um, reasonable people, but they're not, they're not faithful people. They're not people of the faith, of, of, of the revelation of God given to Abraham and passed all the way down until the, the advent of Jesus. But what happens is when this star goes up, they recognize that the universe, God, in its amorphic, whatever way that they know him, has done something new. Something new is being revealed, and they need to find out what it is because they're truth seekers. They want to know the way things are and why so that they can live that way. So they can, they can understand reality and apply themselves to it. So... When we're looking at the, the story here, a lot of times we think, okay, Christmas, then 12 days later, Epiphany. This is where we get the 12 days of Christmas, by the way, if you didn't know. The Epiphany typically is celebrated 12 days after Christmas. Because we're Americans and we do what we want, we move Epiphany to the closest Sunday to when it falls, so it's not really 12 days later, we're actually 14 days later. But if we were to celebrate Epiphany when we were supposed to, like when this parish did on Friday when we had that awesome party, Right? That would have been 12 days later. The Magi did not show up 12 days later. This is, a, this is the way we celebrate it in liturgical order. These dudes were coming from a long, long way away. And this is the ancient times. So when we see them show up and talk to Herod, right? Because it's the first thing you do when you show up in somebody's house. You go to the, the owner of that house and you're like, hey... Can, do you mind if we come in and see this thing that's, that's going on, right? I mean, these guys needed to show up and let Herod know that they weren't an invading army 
coming to take over Judea. They were like, hey, we just want to go see this Christ child, this new thing that's happening, right? That was probably anywhere between two months and a year after Jesus is born, right? And how do we, how do we deduce that? Well, first of all, Jesus is born in a manger, a stable. The Magi show up and find him in a house. Okay, so enough time has, has passed that, that the, the influx of people for the, the census has trickled, trickled out. So Mary and Joseph and Jesus now have a place to stay. Okay, that's probably a couple days. Fine. It's before they go to flee into Egypt because Herod finds out about this, right? And so they haven't had enough time to sort of return to Nazareth, which is what they would have naturally done if they had enough time. Mary's recovering if she needed to recover or whatever they're doing. They're getting their, their house in order with a newborn baby in Bethlehem, and they're not ready to move back to Nazareth yet, right? So I'd say before a year. Now, Herod himself is kind of probably playing an over-under game. This, this newborn king that's threatening me, he's at this point when these magi show up because he ascertained from them when the star showed up, and what does Herod do? He goes and pursues all babies under the age of two. Now, if I were a king and I wanted to make sure that my throne was secure from this little infant that was going to come and supplant me because I'm such a good king that a two-year-old could do my job, then I would make sure that I got him, right? Right? So I wouldn't just say, if he was two years old, I wouldn't just say go and kill all the two-year-olds. They didn't have birth certificates back then. They had to kind of estimate the age of that kid. Could you imagine being some Jewish mom trying to convince one of Herod's guards, no, 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 my baby is actually two years and two months old. You don't have to kill him, right? So it's probably closer to a, a eight months to a year. And Herod is like, just kill everybody under the age of two so that we're sure to get him, right? So the Magi... When they show up, what we're actually looking at is months after Jesus was born. Okay? Now, this is not important necessarily for us to, to understand anything morally speaking, but when we read the scriptures, it's important for us, especially when we're reading some of these condensed stories. Right? They're, they're histories. They're real, they're real events that happen, but they've been really condensed so that they can fit onto a papyrus roll. Right? So we're talking several months, and so when, when the wise men show up, they had to have been traveling for a long time. And we have in our mind this image of these three dudes right here knocking on a door, all kind of filing in nice and neatly with their little boxes and whatever this guy's doing down here, uh, and, and prostrating themselves and showing the, the child Jesus the gifts that they brought. But in reality, are three well-dressed, wealthy dudes going to be going over sand dunes with snakes and scorpions and bandits for two months by themselves? No. A caravan of dromedaries. If you listen to the first reading, you would have had the sense of thousands of people pouring out from the east, seeking the truth, the light that has come into the world. These three guys, each one of them probably had a retinue of people. They had their scientists that wanted to come along and take notes. They had their slaves that were going to be carrying all their provisions, guiding the donkeys and the camels that had all their, their provisions for months of travel in the ancient world. Right? They probably had some doctors. They probably had guards. Of course they had guards. They're carrying gold. You know what's more expensive than gold in the ancient world? Frankincense. Right? I mean, these guys are loaded down with the wealth of the nations. Again, looking at the first reading, coming, this prophecy is coming true. The wealth of the nations are being poured out to Israel in this huge splen splendiferous array of, of peacock-clad folks of the East, these mysterious people showing up. This would, have been, uh, this would have been an event. Of course, they, again, like I said, they first show up at Herod's palace, and Herod is already feeling intimidated because just one of these dudes probably outshines Herod, and three of them show up. What's happening? He's, he feels completely out of control. And they're really interested in some kid? That really scares Herod. Right? 
So that's kind of our context. This is, this, is what, this is what we have happening. You can imagine whatever house Mary and Joseph and Jesus are staying in, just sort of being inundated and surrounded by like all these, these tents and camels and, 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 and uh, uh, donkeys and supplies getting strewn out everywhere and all the, cl- the clamor of pots and pans. And it's like, what in the world? An army is camping outside of this house because they want to see Jesus. And this is the real takeaway, right? That these guys go to these insane lengths, dangerous, expensive, lunatic, lunatic, lunacy, this this lunacy-ish journey from their comfortable palaces and libraries in the east because something real has happened and they're interested in understanding the real. Not staying in their error when it's been revealed to them that it was wrong, but changing and going out of themselves to find what is so that they could be more like it. Right? As we said, they're not Jews, and this is where we get to the the mystery of salvation that that God is working in the advent of Christ. We can see that from the beginning, he intended for all of the nations to come to salvation. He began this movement of, of of, of salvation by claiming a single people to be peculiarly his own, the Jews, but so that from them might come a salvation that all people might be his. We live in a Christian age when we have North Americans and South Americans and Africans and Europeans and Asians all sitting in this one room right now. And it doesn't doesn't surprise us. It's normal. Right? That's not the way it's always been. I mean, certainly culturally it's not the way it's always been, but religiously that's not the way it's always been. We're so used to the idea, especially living in the United States, that most people we bump into, although this is changing sadly, most people we bump into are Christians. And it doesn't surprise us that somebody with a different skin color or a different accent shares the same faith as us. But that was a weird thing, certainly was a a foreign concept when these guys showed up to see Jesus. But that's why Jesus himself showed up, so that all of the world might be drawn to him. Remember, we're told in another place when when Christ is talking about his crucifixion, I must be raised up, and when I am raised up high, I will draw all people to myself. This is the, this is the, the meaning of Paul's a litany, when he gets into this a couple times, he said, in Christ Jesus, there is no Jew or Greek, no Scythian or Cyprian. There is no, there is no rich or poor. There is no male or female. There is no, there's no, because when we're in Christ Jesus, we are in one body. We are one thing. That unity that Christ brings, he offers to the whole world. Not automatically, but to those who come to see him. We do not automatically become Christians. We do not automatically go to heaven. We do not automatically find the truth. We do not automatically know how to pray. We have to get up off our cushions and journey however far and however long and over whatever fraught perils that we need to to go and find the one that we see is truth made flesh. Find Jesus. But that every single person in the world is called to that, is invited to that. That's what it means when we say the church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. It means that every single human person who has ever been made by the procreative union of a man and a woman with God's influence is is meant and made for the church. The church is the universal receptacle for all of our soul plugs to go into. Every person fits into the church. 
every person ever born anywhere finds their home, can only find their home, in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church because it's only there, and there is no debating this, it is only there that we find the infant Jesus. It is only there that we find the Messiah. It's only there that we find the sacrifice. It's only there that we find the risen Lord. And it is only there in His name by which and under which no other name in the world does one find salvation. And nobody has an excuse if these three dudes can do it. They had every reason in the world to ignore that star. They were already smart. They were already well thought of. They were already wealthy. They were already comfortable. They were already uh, established. Nobody would challenge anything. They said, if these guys thought it was important enough to go and find the new truth, the new thing that God revealed, almost died. <laughs> then nobody else has an excuse. And nobody else can say, oh, I'll sit here, God can come to me. Uh-uh. It's not the way that works. He's already done that in Christ Jesus. He's already come most of the way. He's already come all the way. All he needs us to do is turn around. Right? And this is kind of where we get into the, the understanding of the, the, the moral aspect of the mystery of this epiphany. Right? What's happening here? We have these wise men, wealthy, intelligent, certain of themselves, right? who nevertheless have within themselves the virtue of humility to recognize that they might not know everything, and when something new is shown them, and they know that to be true, and it conflicts with something else they know, they let this go. This was clearly wrong, and this is right. That humility gives them the confidence to not be, um, not be insecure at the thought that their Zoroastrianism, that their understanding of science, that their understanding of, of, of culture or the world might be wrong now as it is held up to the light of Christ, the Son of God, come into the world. And they change. Remember, we're told they go back by a different way. Now, literally, that means they took a different route home. But you can all, you all, we also always read the Scriptures in, in a spiritual sense. Uh, 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 there's three different senses of the spiritual, but we can understand that in all three of the spiritual senses as a metanoia, turning around and a going back a different way. They're different people. They're changed by the encounter with Christ. This humility that they show is in stark contrast to the pride and arrogance that they see in Herod that we see in Herod. Herod is intimidated by the coming of the Christ. Why? Because he's selfish. Because he wants things the way he wants them to be. He wants God to do what he wants God to do. He has no interest in being a humble clay in the hands of the potter, of, of himself being changed in light of God, rather he would rather change God in light of what he wants, where he is. We do this to God all the time. We get mad at God when our lives don't turn out or things in our life don't turn out the way that we wanted them to be. And we have convinced ourselves, because we're Christians, that what we want for our lives must naturally be what God wants for my life. And so when that doesn't happen, we get mad at him. We're intimidated by the fact that we are in, in, in almost complete, uh, uh, we are complete, almost completely out of control of our lives. And so much of our life is, I mean, we, 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 so much of our lives is out of our control that we try not to think about it. The amount of our life that rests in the providence of God and the, and the spinning of, 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 of the laws of, of nature. Right? And yet we believe ourselves the, master, the, de the masters of our own destiny. And so when things go awry, we, get, we, find, we look for somebody to blame. Right? This is the arrogance of Herod, in contrast to the humility of the wise men. How many of us sitting in here um, have, ha 
have an, a persistent and an obstinate disagreement with what the church teaches with the voice of Jesus Christ. Some doctrine, some moral law, some expectation that Christ has of us through the, 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 the articulation of the church, and we ourselves think, no, I must be right about that, and the church is wrong. That's Herod. If you think that way, you're thinking like Herod. Unlike the Magi who say, oh, I've always thought this, but now I've discovered that the church or Jesus Christ says it differently, says that it's differently. He must be right. You know why? Because he made the whole thing. So I must be wrong. And I must change the way I think, the way I expect, the way I desire to be more like him. If we say thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if we say you are king, if we say like John the Baptist, you must increase and I must decrease, how can we then go and stand before him and tell him he needs to change to be more like us? Because surely we're right and he's wrong. This is the battle between the wise men and Herod that's being presented by Luke in the Gospel. But Herod is an arrogant prideful man, and these, these pagans are humble and receptive to Christ. And because of that, they gain the fruits. They merit the fruits of their encounter with Jesus. They get to go back by a different way. They inherit the kingdom of heaven. In our lives, do we want to be more like the wise men or do we want to be like Herod? When we put it in those words, it's easy to say, I want to be like the wise men, I don't want to be like Herod. You have to live that way, though. You have to say and recognize your own smallness before the grandeur and the splendor of Holy Mother Church. You have to realize your own limited understanding of the universe before the articulation of the Word, which is Jesus the Christ that our culture has gone off the rails. And if we stay on those rails, we are find ourselves in utter destruction. But instead, we leave those tracks and we climb the ladder of, of, uh, of Jacob, which is upon which the angels ascend and descend and leads to heaven. We have to change and go back by a different road in our lives. Even coming here, my coming here this morning, I come with my own baggage and my own woundedness and my own sinfulness. Is this Mass going to be an encounter with Jesus sufficient enough for me that when I leave this celebrating, the celebration of this Mass, I will have amended my life. I will have desired to be better. I will have let go of some of that baggage. I will have repudiated those sins. This is the question that, that, I, I, that, that I and we all should ask ourselves every time we come to Mass. But not only that, every time we wake up in the morning, will I look for the star that has risen in the sky? Will I pursue the Christ today? Will I find Him? And in finding Him, will I recognize in myself what is failing and what is weak and what is broken and what is wrong and let the Christ heal those things so that I am different and go, by, go, go away by a different road? Am I willing to let God change me today? Or will I be obstinate in who I am and expect Him to change to suit me? And that is the true definition of paganism. Right? And then finally, they, I know this is a bit long. Are you guys doing okay? No? Did you say no? Okay. Finally, they, they bring him three gifts. We'll go, these, these are pretty well known, so we won't spend any time on them at all. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold for the king. Uh, frankincense for worship, the God-man. And uh, myrrh, which is an embalming fluid or a burial spice for the sacrifice to be made. Isn't it odd, the gifts that they bring him? What that indicates to us is that they've done some preparation. We're going to see this king. The star has gone up in the sky, a new thing has happened. 
what is this new thing? They've already thought about it before they go. And they recognize in Christ, the King of kings, this is the one whom I must obey. They recognize in him the God-made flesh, the God-made visible, the God-man. This is the one I must worship. And they recognize in him the priest and the sacrifice to be made for the salvation, not of the Jews particularly, but of the whole world. This is the one from whom I will obtain my salvation. These three men sought Christ with a reckless abandon and an undivided heart before they even knew who he was. And in finding him, understood him correctly. And because of that, were changed and went, away by, went back by a different road. This is the moral takeaway for us, living in a Christian age. That even today, we seek Christ with an undivided and a reckless abandon. So that in finding him, we may pay him homage, we may worship him, and we may obtain from him what he came to give us, the wedding between our humanity and his divinity. So that as his divinity takes on that little baby flesh, our humanity might take on his divinity, and we might be enriched beyond measure. We might share in his divine nature, and we ourselves might be wherever he is, in the glory and splendor of the Father.